Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the UE St. Augustine Faculty of Law Research Skills Series. This is RSS 2 for the academic year 2023-2024. Some of you are with us in RSS 1, where we looked at conducting legal research. Today, we turn to the role of law in policymaking. So a very interesting topic for those of us who want to know, well, how does what we study actually impact the real world? How can we transfer our legal skills into these huge developments we hear about all the time? How do these developments even take place? So with us today, we have two experts in our field. We have our very own lecturer from the faculty, Mr. Eden Charles, who will be talking about climate change. And we have Ms. Cavell Joseph, who is attorney, but she's working in the World Bank, so reaching great heights, and she's going to be going first today. So as you all know, our speakers introduce themselves. For today's format, we're going to have both speakers present, and then we will take questions at the end. So at the end, you can use the chat or you can unmute yourselves. And of course, if you have a speaker specific question, please do let us know because both speakers will be speaking on the role of law and policymaking, but from different backgrounds. So Cavell, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Emma, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, to uh, your students as well as any other colleagues that have joined online. Um, so my name is Kavel Joseph. Um, I have been working uh, in international uh, gender policy for the, uh, over seven and a half years. Um, and I originally am from Trinidad and Tobago, as Emma mentioned. I got called to the bar in Trinidad and then I came to do my master's at American University in International Legal Studies. Um, and so my last few years, I've been focusing mostly um, on gender policy, looking at the gender inequalities that exist both in the Caribbean as well as around the world. Um, and so my presentation today will be focusing on what the international, uh, what are some of the international legal uh, policies that have developed and how that is impacting both the uh, regional and as well as the local level. So the first uh, aspect that I would like to look at, and before I go into, into, my, into my presentation, one of the main questions I would like for the audience members to ask is, how does the rule of law shape the very policies that govern our daily lives? Now, this graph that I have here, kind of uh, some, a few examples of what are some international laws that exist that, that have created some of the gender uh, principles as, and, and gender policies that exist in the Caribbean as well as in Trinidad and Tobago. So we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that some of you may be aware of that was adopted in 1948. We have the, by the uh, UN General uh, Assembly, we have the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women that was adopted in 1979. We also have the Declaration on the Violence Against Women, uh, Violence Against Women that was adopted in 1993. We also have the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court that was adopted in 1998. And then we have the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, which was adopted in 2000. So the foundation of what is, what is, what is the foundation of law and policy making? The foundation of law and policy making involves the creation of institutions and processes that are designed to ensure that laws and policies are developed and implemented in a fair and transparent manner. Uh, this includes the establishment of legislative bodies such as parliaments, as well as the creation of agencies and judicial systems. Laws serve as a formal and binding set of rules, while policies, on the other hand, detail how the law will actually be implemented. Um, laws also serve as a formal and binding set of rules, while policies, uh, sorry, laws also, policies that lack a uh, foundation on law can be deemed invalid or unenforceable, leaving a void in good governance. Some laws can be complex, for example, and open to interpretation, making policy implementation challenging. Laws also ensure that policymakers are held accountable for their decisions and their policies 
and that the, the policies adhere to international standards. They offer protection against arbitrary uh, policy decisions. Laws also empower regulatory agencies to implement policy, public policy. So for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have the Equal Opportunity Act that was implemented in 2000 which prohibits discrimination on various grounds, such as sex and gender. And the Equal Opportunity Commission came out of that act that helps enforce uh, the uh, legislation by in, uh, allowing the agency to be able to investigate complaints, um, mandate, uh, mediate disputes, and promote uh, understanding of the principles of equal opportunity. So what has been the actual role of international law in public policy? International laws play a pivotal role in shaping policy making at both the domestic and international levels, as I, I had mentioned. Here are some a uh, uh, few examples of the roles that, that it has actually played. One, in stand, st standard setting. So international laws help set standards and norms that states are expected to adhere to. So for example, the same Universal Declaration of Human Rights that I had mentioned earlier, helps set forth the fundamental human rights that should be protected. Many countries have integrated these rights into either their national constitutions or local uh, policies. Two, promoting gender equality. The, uh, international laws have helped to advance gender equality in sectors like employment, education, and health. For example, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, also known as CEDAW, is often described as the International Bill of Rights for Women. Many countries, uh, after ratifying CEDAW, have revised their legislative framework to ensure the they they comply with the international with the conventions provisions resulting in improved gender equality in different social sectors another example is the declaration of on the elimination of violence against women which was adopted in 1993 and emphasizes the responsibility of states to prevent um gender-based violence and in alignment with this declaration Many countries have adopted uh, domestic violence laws. They've also uh, conducted campaigns to educate uh, local people and also to the development of local shelters for victims and or survivors of domestic violence. So what has been the impact specifically on the international, uh, uh, the impact of, of international gender on Caribbean policy? Uh, many countries have ratified, as I mentioned, the international uh, and regional conventions to increase gender equality and address gender-based violence. All countries in the Caribbean have ratified CEDAW, which was the uh, international uh, con uh, doc uh, uh, convention that I just mentioned. Uh, since then, uh, several countries, for example, the Bahamas, when it ratified its CEDAW uh, in 1993, took steps to adopt uh, legislation on violence against women, um, also to in Trinidad and Tobago with the ratification in 1993 of CEDAW, also adopted the Domestic Violence Act. Um, and most, most recently, we saw um, the reforms in uh, our marriage legislation in 2017 that, uh, that reformed the laws that had existed because prior to that, there were exceptions where child marriage was allowed on the legal books. Um, also too, we have a constitutional reform since ratifying CEDAW, for example, Belize has amended its constitution in 2008 to prohibit discrimination based on sex, reflecting the, again, CEDAW's principles. So we are really seeing that by having clear international uh, standards that, and when countries are able to ratify those standards, that it is playing a role on local legislation as well as Caribbean po uh, local policy. Um, also too, we see influence 
of uh, regional bodies. For example, the Car uh, Caribbean community, also known as CARICOM, as we all know, plays a very significant role in integrating international gender equality standards into regional policies. CARICOM's gender equality strategy, for instance, draws upon uh, global standards and aims to miss mainstream gender into its uh, development projects on the ground. For example, CARICOM's push for gender mainstreaming has led to countries like Barbados adopting national policy on gender to ensure that gender perspectives are incorporated into all policies, programs, and projects. The, and the third uh, role is uh, policy benchmarking. International laws offer Caribbean nations a benchmark against which they can measure their progress in gender equality. Regular reporting obligations, in, in particularly, for example, in CEDO, their countries are required to report or, or, or give in updates as to what are some of the legislative and policy changes they have taken at the local level. Um, and so that is a way that is how also international policy is playing an active role in local Caribbean policy um, at the local level. And then finally, in terms of civil society, international laws play a very important role for civil society because they are able to advocate to their governments of the necessary changes that need to be implemented. So civil society is empowered by these international um, laws that e exist in particularly in terms of gender rights. And I just wanted to also share with you guys this particular graph. Um, this graph really does show the effects of, um, of the, for example, CEDO, where it was, this, was a this graph is based on a study that was done by Women, Business and the Law in the World Bank um, and the Women, Business and the Law team, which was a team that I was a part of for over three years, um, looks at the gender inequalities across the globe. And in this study, they looked at countries that had adopted CEDO um, and, they, and looked at what were some of the laws that existed in those countries 15 years. And so they saw that uh, 15 years prior to CEDAW's implementation, countries had, se several countries had uh, either legal constraints um, that may have been limitations to women's opportunities in terms of inheritance rights or mobility or childcare opportunities or provisions. Um, and then we see that that it slowly starts to make a change around the 55 years before CEDAW, but not still as much as in the final, uh, when we look at what was done five years after CEDAW's ratification, where we do see a drastic increase in reduction of constraints that, uh, that limit women's opportunities, both in employment as well as in entrepreneurship. One second. And then we have also to the impact of law on gender public policy in, term, in terms of economic public, public, public policy. So the Human Rights Council of the United Nations 54th session earlier this month, around, in, around the first week of uh, October, really urged states to um, really redistribute care work and invest increase investment in care and support. And this is because we've come to really understand about how childcare laws, as well as just general care policy, can help to promote economic development. And the, the this particular um, session really looked at the fact that, that not only childcare laws in, in terms of uh, accessing uh, uh, childcare centers uh, at the local level, but also to looking at, at those who uh, take care of those who are uh, who have disabilities um, as well as any other uh, limitations because the reality is that based on the data that has been done by international organizations, they have seen that the, that the majority of the burden is on women. So by having provisions that really address these core issues um, can help with economic policy um, and economic development at the local level. 
So the benefits of, uh, of child care laws in particular are, are three, there are three main benefits. One, availability. Child care laws help expand access to child care by supporting different types of child care provisions and its convenience. Two, affordability. Child care regulation improves child service provisions, especially for low income or vulnerable families through government support. And three, quality. Child care regulation helps ensure a safe environment for children, contributes to healthier nutrition and school readiness and promotes uptake. So how has the law been creating new advancements for gender policy, public policy? These are some examples. So for one, equal pay legislation. Laws addressing pay equity aim to close the gender gap by in requiring employer, employers to provide equal pay for equal work, regardless of gender. Such legislation promotes economic empowerment for women. Two, online sexual harassment laws. Laws against sexual harassment in the workplace and in particularly an online and in public spaces create a safer environment for women and others who may be vulnerable to sexual harassment. These laws promote gender equality and protect individuals from harassment and abuse. The third, a third example is reproductive rights legislation. Laws that protect reproductive rights, such as access to contraception <coughs> and safe abortion, empower women to make choices about their reproductive health and family planning. Gender quotas. Also, some countries have introduced gender quotas in political representation, uh, requiring a certain percentage of seats in legislation or corporate boards, <laughs> sorry, apologies, to uh, be held by, <laughs> by women. Uh, this legal me mechanism helps increase women's participation in decision-making processes. And then we also have gender responsive, <laughs> apologies, uh, gender responsive um, budgeting, legislation or policies promoting gender, Responsive budgeting ensure <coughs> ensure that government budgets consider the specific needs and impacts of women and men. This approach directs resources to areas that benefit gender equality and data collection requirements. Le <coughs> Legal mandates for gender disaggregated data collection help governments and organizations monitor progress towards gender equality and make evidence-based policy decisions. So in conclusion, I would like to reiterate that law is the foundation of public policy. Two, laws have helped shape gender and economic development. And three, laws are creating advancements for public policy. And, to, and finally, I would just like to reiterate that to effectively shape public policies, we must be informed about the legal framework, existing policies, and the issues at hand. It is our duty to educate ourselves in these matters and seek out reliable sources of information. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kavel. That was very interesting. And what resonated with me was the data collection requirement, because I saw that you gave the pie chart showing the changes um, that were happening before CETA and the changes that were then really spurred on by it. And I was thinking about how when Guyana introduced the um, sexual offenses court that one of the reasons they did this is of course to have sensitization for those types of crimes but also because they need to collect data on well is this having an impact is this helping with reporting and justice being served so i think that's super important and i also really like your point on the gendered work because i read an article this week in the economist where in china they used to have a lot of accessible child care centers until about 1978 now they don't really accept children in nurseries until they are three so because both parents need to work because the economic climate we're in, grandparents are really kind of taking the responsibility for this. 
And they interviewed different grandparents and the grandfathers were like, yeah, this is great. We love having our grandkids with us. And the grandmothers are like, this is exhausting. <laughs> and this is not really what we anticipated doing in our retirement. So the gendered work and, you know, things like accessible childcare, all that is super important. So thank you for that. I'm sure we'll have some interesting questions at the end. But I'm going to hand over to Eden now. Um, Eden, you'll let me know when to switch your slides because I have it on my side. Okay. And then we'll take questions. So let me put Thank you, Emma. Slides. Thank you, Dr. Farrow. No problem. You can put up the first slide. All I right. am pleased to participate in this activity. I want to thank Emma for her hard work and my colleague, um, Cavell, for joining us. I am Eden Jack, lecturer in law, the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies. I also perform other functions. I am a member of the Committee of Legal Experts of the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law. I also serve as a special representative of the Secretary General of the International Civil Authority for the Enterprise. Whereas it is true that I will touch on climate change, my presentation will not be solely based on climate change. Right? I'm going to look at the role of law in policymaking from an international law perspective. Next slide. All right. What is international law? The approach taken by traditional scholars is that international law is not law, but mere rules of morality rather than any means of creating binding legal obligations. This has been the approach of some scholars um, in the dualist model or the monistic approach. What is the dualist model? The dualist model is where international law only becomes law when you pass implementing legislation. Um, monism, the monistic model, advocates that international law automatically becomes a part of the law when you become a party to your treaty. Whether that is so or not, I hope that we'll be able to say that at the end of the day in terms of its impact on policy. Next slide. All right, so despite what was said in terms of international law not being law, um, there are scholars like Professor McDougall, um, I agree with McDougall and others, that although we do not have a superior authority to enforce international rules, International law is considered by states from a customer international law point of view or public international law policy as a uh, proper law, notwithstanding the, um, the lack of a supranational body to enforce it. Next slide. All right. Now, I think in seeking to situate um, law into the corpus of International, international policy or policy making, we could approach it from the position of inclusivity versus exclusivity. What do you mean by that? The international community has thrown up, has created a number of institutions, multilateral institutions in the main, which provide a forum for inclusivity. So, States coming together at the United Nations, at the European Union, at CARICOM, at Mercosur, would adopt hard law instruments or soft law instruments. And in main, they are required to implement them in terms of their domestic law, as well as their um, domestic policies to administer the law. Uh, has that been done? is the question we will answer. As opposed to the exclusivity uh, approach where there are exclusive clubs, like you have certain states who form themselves into groupings and the groupings are named by their numbers, the G this and the G that. Is that really inclusive approach to making of international policy which will impact on the 193 members of the international community? Or is it part of the exclusive club that you do not have a say, but yet others are seeking to pass laws or other directives which would impact upon you? So let's look briefly. And I, I think Cavell mentioned uh, Resolution 1325 of the United Nations Security Council. And let's look at UN General Assembly resolutions and Security Council resolutions and their impact on lawmaking or policymaking domestically. How uh, has states reacted to UN General Assembly resolutions and 
Chief Security Council resolution. Are these resolutions politically binding or are they legally binding? Do they inform national policy? Next slide, Emma. Let's look, for example, at the United Nations Charter. The United Nations Charter is seen as accepted as binding on all, on all members of the United Nations. As a matter of fact, there are aspects of the Charter which speak to um, the situation of non-self-governing uh, territories who are still under colonial occupation. You know, in the Caribbean, for example, we have British overseas colonies, uh, uh, colonies and so on, territories. And yet the United Nations has a word, a word to say on that. But I think it is, it is timely for us to address what's going on in the Middle East, Israel and Palestine. We have a situation where by virtue of an action, um, born 1948, uh, out of the old Palestine, two states were created, Israel and Palestine. The question is this, despite resolutions of the United Nations Security Council, which, which have the force of law, Security Council resolutions have the force of law, which mean they're binding on all states and states are expected uh, to put measures in place uh, to, uh, to adhere to them. I recall when I was at the United Nations and a resolution was adopted uh, by the Security Council on foreign terrorist fighters eh? who, who were leaving to go to um, fight I ISIS. And Trinidad and Tobago, as a non permanent, as a non member of the Council, decided to co sponsor that resolution. Was open. We co sponsored it and we were bound. We had to do X and Y and Z in order to implement them. And that was okay. But what about other resolutions which speak to the right to self-determination of people? Although Security Council has passed certain resolutions, are we seeing that in the Middle East in terms of the right to self-determination of people who continue to be um, living as refugees in different parts of the Middle East? So has international law, whether soft law, which is an important tool of international law, fallen short? Has hard law fallen short? in terms of the, the inclusivity of international policy making, or are we just into old talk? Next slide. But despite that, I, and I don't want to be so negative as a multilater multilateralist myself, we have seen uh, United Nations General Assembly resolution, which are politically binding, but not um, does not have the same weight as security council resolutions, but they're important. Because sometimes, uh, my dear audience, treaty making is cumbersome, it's difficult, it is slow, but avenues are formed to influence domestic or national policy making via soft instruments. So we have, for example, United Nations resolution on bottom trolling, which is a very destructive efficient practice. This resolution not a, is not a treaty, but a number of states have been able to incorporate the provisions of this resolution into the domestic le um, legislation, politically binding um, soft instrument from the United Nations General Assembly, now finding themselves into hard law at the domestic level. That's a success story. Then we have what we call illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Every year in the omnibus resolution adopted by the United Nations General Assembly, or in policy directives adopted by United Nations Environmental Program and the Food and Agricultural Organization, we see measures being adopted. For example, in the specific case of the Unger Resolution on illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. I mentioned this uh, of note because a number of states, including the European Union states, have adopted these policies, these international inclusivity policies via resolution into the domestic um, laws. Recently, Trinidad and Tobago was red flag after receiving a yellow flag and Dr. Kuhl, that is Justin Kuhl, he's a football referee as well, with no red flag and red flag and yellow flag. What it meant? Trinidad and Tobago was red flag as having not complied with the international inclusivity approach by updating its laws to give effect to measures to prohibit illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing as a consequence of the deleterious effects of IU fishing on international fish stock. Next question, next slide, sorry. I've also witnessed the importance of 
resolutions on small arms and light weapons. Are they important? Yes, they're important. Long before the United Nations adopted an arms trade treaty, and I'm familiar with that treaty because I led the CARICOM negotiations at the UN on this United Nations arms trade treaty, all CARICOM states are expected now to pass laws in place to give effect to the provision of this arms trade treaty to address matters relating to illegal broker, brokering, arms transfers, illicit, illicit trades, and so on. And CARICOM states have not passed any legislation to give effect to that because domestic legislation could be cumbersome, could be bureaucratic. You need to have legislative drafts people. You need to have um, the political will to do it. It must be prioritized. We haven't seen that. All that one time Trinidad and Tobago was um, being considered to be the headquarters of the arms trade treaty. However, regarding the UNGA resolution on small arms and light weapons, we have seen some success stories. That resolution, politically binding, soft law, being adopted, and we have seen in the Caribbean what we call training of the trainers series, where we get international assistance from United Nations Office on, 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 on this armament to train our protective services in measures relating to the, um, the prevention of the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons. Is this sufficient, barring the non-implementation of the hard law instrument, United Nations Arms Trade Treaty, I'm not sure because as you see up and down the Caribbean, the undertakers are having a field day with the amount of um, homicides, especially in Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica. Um, I already spoke about security council resolutions having the force of law, Emma. So next, next slide. But the international community has developed institutions. One institution is the International Law Commission. What is the role of the International Law Commission? The International Law Commission is charged with the responsibility to aid in the codification, dissemination, and wider appreciation of international. Codification, dissemination, and wider appreciation of international. It is the ILC which takes decisions adopted by the General Assembly, the Sixth Committee in particular, and formulate these uh, decisions into draft legal instruments, which then now return to uh, national states for the implementation as law and policy. Trinidad and Tobago, for example, is seen, and a number of Trinbegonians will know that, as having paternity for the establishment of the International Criminal Court due to the pioneering work of former Prime Minister and President Elaine late Arthur N. R. Robinson, who in a General Assembly um, speech made a statement calling for the prosecution of international criminal. He was not the precursor of the idea, but he took up a 19th century idea, which was under the carpet. What happened? The International Law Commission adopted draft articles based on discussion in the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly. We saw now inclusivity because the ILC draft articles now found themselves in a conference called the Rome Conference on the International Criminal Court, which gave birth to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And a number of states, parties have also now passed that into, into their laws. So they're expected to prosecute those who commit crimes which cringe the concerns of humanity under Article 5 of the Rome Statute. The question is, how effective has that been? Are some criminals, international criminals in certain countries, uh, Excuse, are they not prosecuted? How is inclusivity benefiting the international community when some heinous crimes who are begging in terms of prosecutor, prosecution? As I told my international law students last year, when one looks at the I, ILC and not ICC, this is an error there, the National Law Commission, draft articles on state, on state responsibility. This is an effective means of showing the importance of soft law. These draft articles state, um, um, colleagues, on state responsibility, they're not hard law. Yet a number of the states have adopted them as policy and as domestic law, guiding them on the, their responsibilities under international law for the acts of sovereigns and other entities. Next slide. And now let's look at a bit of climate change here. 
which is the most, which is the existential threat to humanity. And we're going to juxtapose that with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Most recently, I was in Hamburg, Germany, I believe early September, and the Committee of Legal Experts on the, on the Commission of Small Islands, State on Climate Change, of which I'm a member, we made presentations before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. We are saying that under the Paris Agreement, there's clear policy in terms of what countries call their nationally determined contributions, where states indicate that they will do X and Y and Z in terms of reducing uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases and other anthropogenic sources into the atmosphere to reduce the impact of climate change. Because you know, under the Paris Agreement, we are aspiring to 1.5 degrees. As Sid says, small island states say to stay alive. Although when we were in Paris, we got two, two degrees Celsius. A number of states since the pandemic and the war in, in, in Ukraine have receded a bit because the national determined contributions which they have made are not legally binding. So they are, they are able now to massage their policy, notwithstanding the Paris Agreement, to their own political and sometimes opportunistic considerations. So what, what the commission did before the tribunal, we said, no, 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 there has to be an interplay between the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Because there are legally binding obligations under Part 12 on the protection of the marine environment. And Part 12 speaks to states taking all measures to prevent the emission of all forms of pollution. We submitted respectfully that all forms must also include in the 21st century greenhouse gas emissions. Although when UNCLOS was adopted over 40 years ago, climate change was not an issue. So we are hoping to get a robust opinion from the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which would unpack and provide concrete guidance, provide uh, a policy direction to states parties to the Law of the Sea Convention on what measures they should adopt in implementing the provisions on the part 12 of UNCLOS to ensure that they are able to do more than where, where the Paris Agreement allows them to do these voluntary national determined contributions by carrying out legal obligation under UNCLOS to protect the marine environment and um, ensure that in formulating their policies and their laws, they include greenhouse gas, gas emissions under the obligations under Part 12 of the, of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. Next slide, please. So I mentioned another advisory opinion. And we believe and I believe wholeheartedly the, the advisory opinion would help. Also, the advisory opinion on climate change, which is more, which is wider than the one we submitted before the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which is a specialized court asking for specific treaty interpretations. Under the ICJ advisory opinion, which will be heard next year, I think um, the oral proceedings will, will start sometime next year, wider. States being armed with two advisory opinions, which are not legally binding, but are highly persuasive to formulate policy, will be in a better position. Why do I why do I say that? I say that because I have been present when, for example, I was present in 2011 when the International Seabed Authority adopted, uh, requested, sorry, an advisory opinion, the International Seabed Authority, requesting an advisory opinion of the very International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea on the liability of sponsoring states who would eventually engage in international seabed mining. And states in negotiating the mining code wanted to know what the liabilities are. The Law of the Sea Convention is very general, it is very um, broad. And the advisory opinion from the Tribunal of, for, from, uh, of the Law of the Sea has assisted states now in using its, uh, its, 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 um, its provisions in passing legislation on deep seabed mining as well as the very uh, contracts um, that the Seabed Authority would in the future hand out or conclude with uh, contractors, they would know what the liability regime is based on international best practices, for example, on environmental impact assessments and so on. So looking back, it's important to look ahead. We have seen the, the impact that this 2011 advisory opinion has had on policy making, on inclusivity, it's inclusive because the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is made up of judges elected 
by state parties to the, to the convention. So we are seeing that it will be very useful. Next slide. New developments. Most recently, we have seen the United Nations adopted uh, a new implementing agreement under the Convention on Democracy on the conservation and sustainable use of on marine biological diversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction. How would that help in policy? Marine biolog biological diversity is under threat. Marine biological diversity is also of economic importance to help with sustainable development. Some of the marine genetic resources from these um, um, forms of biological diversity have been used to make pharmaceuticals. So developing states and others said, if that is the case, we want to conserve and sustainably use these resources. But since the Convention of Law of the Sea is very broad, there's a need for a new implementing agreement to flesh out the provisions of the Convention of the Law of the Sea on this particular matter. Bearing in mind that, and Justin and Emma may want to take note of this, some states were seeing it as possible to establish intellectual property rights on, on, on matters belonging to the global commons. This BBNJ treaty, which has been adopted and over for signature, but not as yet entered into force, nor provides the legal framework which would guide the establishment of policies and, and, and laws in future states parties to the treaty on how they conserve and sustainably use these um, very important marine biological resources which belong to part of the common heritage of humankind. As I wrap up, I also want to mention something about the rule of, of civil society. We know that international law is about the, the, the subjects of international law, the primary subjects are states, but we are seeing an increasingly important and increasingly important role made by civil society who are like the conscience of the movement. They, prevent, they, they, they provided tremendous support um, in the BBNG negotiations, in the arms trade, trade negotiations. They say that they are more inclusive in terms of who they represent because they listen to what is said on the man of the street, right by the man of the street, the petition government, government take all of these um, proposals to multilateral bodies like the United Nations, drafted and adopted as soft law instruments, decisions or resolutions, or hard law instruments as treaty law, and then they come back again as policy documents for states to implement. And something like that is taking place as we sit, as I speak, in the United Nations Sixth Committee on Humanitarian Crimes. Next resolution, next slide, sorry. Uh, what extent morals and economic considerations play a role in lawmaking? I would say when one look at some of the human rights treaties that um, Kevel mentioned, we have seen um, a retreat, some would say, and I tell my Jewish students, students a retreat to natural law where um, it is not only what is um, seem to be feasible based on empiricism, but there must be some sort of minimum moral content in law making, which may not make it law. And that is why we are seeing that states now have now taken up the plight of those with disabilities and have codified that into a convention because persons with disabilities um, continue to be at the end of the uh, of, of the, the, the totem pole in terms of the affordability of certain rights. And this convention in rights on, on the rights of persons with disabilities, which is the first human rights treaty adopted by the United Nations in the 21st century, is now giving greater hope to persons with disabilities. Next slide. And that's it. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to help. Right. Thank you so much for that, Eden. Very interesting. So the floor is now open for questions. You can either raise your hand or type in the chat. And while we are waiting for the questions to come in, something I picked up on was you mentioned CARICOM and the need for certain laws to be passed from time to time and the capacity issues. For example, legislative drafters, you need people in the position to do this. So it's a nice time to mention that UE does have an LLM on legislative drafting. So for anyone who finds this type of thing super interesting and wants to have an impact in regional development, I think it's clear from both presentations how important a lot for research would be to go into policymaking and then 
gaining the skills to actually work in these fields. If you're interested in legislative drafting, that's obviously a very specialized field that you need to get training in, but it is training that is available regionally. And I think that's very important to note that we have the potential to have our own capacity coming from within the region. We just need more people to take up these types of opportunities. You also mentioned the CVED, um uses and pharmaceuticals and IP and general commons, which of course is a very controversial topic because whenever pharmaceutical companies get involved and they take what is known as traditional medicine, they put it into pharmaceuticals and they synthesize it and get patents and all types of things that really control the property that was previously cultural commons. It's always a very controversial issue. And it's one where we kind of have difficulty in determining, well, how do we otherwise protect this? We don't necessarily want people to come and commercialize something which should be freely available. But at the same time, it's hard to say, well, how do you own something that is cultural in terms of um, sea life and whatnot? It's not even, it's living things we're also dealing with. So it makes it a bit more complicated. And then, of course, we have the complications with climate change. So I believe right now Trinidad is on level two warning for coral bleaching. We have difficulties with lionfish taking over all the reefs. So there's a lot of terrible things happening, actually. And then to think of the further legal implications of the pharmaceutical intervention. Of course, we want life-saving drugs and interventions to be created, but not at the expense of developing countries. So a lot of interesting things a whole discussion can be had there so now if anyone has a question you can feel free to put it in the chat and i will read it out for the purpose of the recording and the presenters or you can raise your hand and you can speak directly to our presenters okay justin yes you can go ahead Thank you. Uh, thanks to both presenters for your presentations. They were both really interesting. Um, I have a general question, which I would like to hear the response from both entities, because I think the context might be slightly different depending on where you're sitting. Um, so the question is, typically speaking at the international level, all transactions that occur, whether it's lawmaking, policymaking, whatever the case is, is a debate and a discussion and a compromise between the have countries and the have not countries. So we could call them rich countries and poor countries. We could call them powerful countries and weaker countries, whatever terminology you want to use. It's that discussion between the haves and the have nots. Um, coming from a Caribbean perspective or from a developing country perspective, how can we ensure that the policies that are being made at the international level, that's going to be in international policy or in international treaties, how can we ensure that this reflects the needs of those lesser developed countries, those developing countries, et cetera. Are there any mechanisms that are in place to ensure this happens? Because when you look at any of the international treaties, the reality is that it's always in favor of the more dominant countries. Um, so one question is what mechanisms are already in place? And two, um, what mechanisms may you suggest be implemented in the future to ensure uh, better lawmaking or better policy making to, to represent the, the interests of everyone? Okay, okay, I'll go first. Um, interesting, my brother Justin. At the international level, it is true that um, there is some concern regarding the, the interests of developing countries. But having said that, over the years, we have seen developing countries in, just in, in some situations punching above their weight. There's a body called the Alliance of Small Island States, right? Trinidad and Tobago played an important role in the founding of that, that body. It's, it, it's now made up of all small island states from the Pacific, the African and Indian and uh, Ocean and, uh, and, 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 and CARICOM as well. And in terms of the climate change negotiation that we call when I led the delegation for TNT in Paris in 2016, you'd see the small island states from EOSIS negotiating in a wider grouping they belong to called the Group of 77 on China, which is the largest negotiating group in multilateralism, looking after the interest of developing countries. But the developing, but the Group of 133, the G77, is well, not all states are similarly circumstantial. You find Brazil and India, these big players, and so on. And China is part of that too, as well. Eh? So negotiating as EOSIS, calling for 1.5 degrees. Going back to the plenary, we saw um, in multilateralism, you have your maximum 
um, negotiating position, then you have your irreducible minimum negotiation position. Everyone has to leave the table with a smile or, or a smirk. So CARICOM, for example, AOSIS, for example, and other like-minded states were not able to get 1.5 degrees Celsius in the operated paragraph of the Paris Agreement, but at least we're able to get it in the um in the preamble um, provisions, and which is helpful. It, it's a sort of victory. Uh, the Conference of Parties is an important tool as well. Last year, after a number of efforts, uh, small island states were able to get uh, a decision on loss and damage coming out of the COP um, last year in, in, uh, in Sharm el -Sheikh. So there have been instances, and I must also indicate that if one were to look long back before time at the travel preparatory, the negotiating history of the United Nations Convention, and obviously you would see specific provisions on what is an island, yeah? Provisions on the enterprise and the role of the enterprise to assist developing states in future seabed mining. So those were provisions for developing states. But the important thing, um, Justin, is what happens when there's a breach by bigger players? And you win and you you, you still lose. I, I mean, in um, Antigua and Barbuda won against the United States and the internet, um, uh, gambling, internet gaming case at the two levels of the WTO dispute resolution body and appellate body as well, and nothing happened. So the enforceability of um, of some of the the measures which would impact on developing states, I think that could um, be had. Um, more work could be done on that. But I also must note that the ICJ in an advisory opinion requested by the UN General Assembly via Mauritius on the, che the Chagos Island archipelago, when Mauritius was able to win, so to speak, against the United Kingdom, where, and it was indicated that the Mauritian independence was not fully operationalized because the um, United Kingdom did not hand over part of the Mauritian territory, Diego Garcia and other islands. Um, to Mauritius at the time of independence. And now the international community is working to ensure that is implemented. So international uh, small states not with any disadvantage. If you are better organized and we coordinate as CARICOM or AOSIS, I believe, um, and the world is changing slowly but surely, um, there's, there, there's, there's a room for us and there could be some successes. And I also just want to add as well to, um... So from my own experience of being at the World Bank, there's an annual meetings and spring meetings that happen twice a year. And uh, these are opportunities for countries, both developed and developing countries, um, to be engaged with the international organizations, the international uh, development banks, right? Um, and so it's a, it's a time where, like, for example, the ministers of finance from these countries come and they really uh they they negotiate certain um opportunities or finances to be able to address whether that be economic development, whether that may be to develop certain uh gender laws back in their home countries. Um so uh countries can really like small island development states can really uh, maximize uh their 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 voice by using some of the uh, development banks that are out there. Also too, for example, there's the Organization of American States, the OAS, also in the US. Um, and they are ones that, that organization also plays an active role in uh, the region in terms of uh, finding, uh, helping countries in the region find a voice, but also to ensuring that they have uh financial uh opportunities to be able to implement some of the legislation because one of the things that I, I didn't get time to really mention was yes we have these international laws and there are countries that are implementing it but how how does a country actually go about implementing it financially so this is where the international uh development banks play an active role in being able to uh, address some of the financial constraints that may come. And that is not only just gender, that also relates to climate change. For example, the World Bank has um, several projects across the world and including in the Caribbean, for example, in St. Lucia and Grenada, where they are trying to 
address some of the uh, climate change impacts. Um, for example, when the hurricane hit uh, Dominica a few years ago and the island was uh, obviously uh, very much devastated by the hurricane, uh, World Bank comes in there and they help to try and rebuild and provide infrastructure. So uh projects so it, there are mechanisms that i would say that does that it, that does exist but that there is opportunities for it to also be improved as well um on that sense all right and we have a question coming in from the chat from kalish lokman to what extent has Caribbean culture impacted or impeded the application of international law in the region for example as it relates to the application of international human rights in the region Okay, um, it's not, kind of, it's not a convoluted question, but I'll try and answer. It, it depends on what you, the, 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 uh, the purpose of the question means by a Caribbean culture. Or, let, let me give an example. The, the Caribbean countries, for example, um, not Haiti, but Suriname, the, the Anglophone Caribbean countries have abolished the death penalty. Yeah? No, sorry, not, have not abolished the death penalty. The death penalty remains on the statute books. Suriname and Haiti, they have abolished the death penalty. However, every year at the United Nations, there's a resolution which calls for a moratorium on the death penalty. Notwithstanding the nomenclature, when one looks at the provisions, one could interpret this so-called moratorium to mean a call for abolition, right? And the CARICOM states would say, well, not only for cultural reasons, but in terms of the rule of law, in terms of the human rights treaties themselves, and the parent human rights treaty is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We advocate that that covenant does not prohibit the death penalty, but it says that it should be carried out by the highest court and for the most serious crimes and so on. So we would, we would push back and say it's a criminal justice issue it does not violate the human rights of the um, this the capital offender, but his or her human rights are safeguarded and they lose their right to life as a consequence of due process of law and is not contrary to the government. We've had other issues about the interpretation of spouse. What does spouse mean in Caribbean law? Is it um, anti-LGBTQI? And this is where the cultural issues comes up. But CARICOM states always say that um, without prejudice to the future lawmaking on LGBTQI and so on, they adhere to the letter of the law, if not the spirit, but the letter of the law in terms, for example, of what, of what or who is identified as a spouse. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I wanted to just submit those two points um, for your consideration. And just to also add to as well, um, to what Eden said, um, there is also, the, so for example, I'll use uh, gender-based violence, right? The reality is that yes, an international, um, okay, international law has tried and outlined what are some of the obligations that the Caribbean countries have. But as we've seen in reality, and particularly in Trinidad and Tobago, gender-based violence is still a huge problem, even with our amended domestic violence acts and, and also to the development of our shelters. So um the real and that has to do with the fact of culture right we we are still in a, to some extent in existing in a sort of patriarchy in 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 certain in terms of what we view as the head of the household or some you know like the the values that that we are taught not necessarily directly but indirectly so in order to really address uh, gender based violence in trinidad we, it really requires a really in-depth analysis of education, campaigning, and really changing the culture of how, how what men and women see as their role um, in society. Um, so that is also another example of where, yes, we have these laws, but culture clashes are existing because uh, there are still too many uh, victims or survivors of domestic violence in Trinidad and Tobago. And that, that's a reality that still is a problem. Okay, and we have one uh, final question. So from Mel Khan, to what extent can the cautionary measures and control of conventionality be implemented to a state that has breached international law? 
Well, I, I'm not sure about cautionary measures, but uh, there, there are sanctions, for example, in terms of countries of British international law. Let's say, for example, the use of force is prohibited. Um, the United Nations Charter provides for the imposition of sanctions by the United Nations as a body. Uh, but as I indicated earlier on, uh, the, the Charter has to be amended. And more importantly, the rules of procedure and operations of the United Nations Security Council, um, they have to be amended to give effect to the new international order we have. So you, you ought not to have a situation where any particular state breaches an international norms of use cogens, a non-derogable norm, or any other rule of international law, and there are sanctions, but you'd find, for example, any member of the permanent five, the veto wheeling members of the Security Council, could just use one vote and veto. So in terms of breaches of international law, the question is whether or not all states are treated with a degree of equity in terms of how international law treats with them. International law provides measures and approaches and sanctions, but are all these measures and, approach, and approaches or sanctions meted out to um, all breaches of international law, all states? I think here is where um, the political aspect of international law comes in, that who is going to enforce it and who is going to prevent the veto. That is why for more than 20 years now, uh, there has been a movement at the United Nations General Assembly to put some checks on the Security Council, but that, that could only happen if there's reform of the general of the Security Council, removing the veto and increasing the number of permanent members and non-permanent members. 15 members in a, a, a community of 193, five permanent members, the former victors of the of the first world, of the second world war. That cannot be right in the 21st century. And I also would like to add as well to, so I mentioned CEDAW earlier, one of the ways that um, the international community uses, uh, international organizations uses CEDAW uh, in terms of to be uh, to implement on the local level and ensure that states are implementing some of the provisions is that uh, they, for example, states are required to to report on their or what are some of the reforms they have done, and when they don't do that, then CEDAW sends uh, like an analysis report back to the state countries to be like these are some of the gaps that exist. These are some of the areas that you need to address. So that is also some way. It, it's not a you know like a a a, a way of like being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But there is a certain level of cautionary, um, a cautionary approach, but also to uh, uh, international development banks as well. For example, um, they they use some of these international organized uh, international laws and policies to be able to be to when they are negotiating with the local government to be like, these are some of the gaps that exist. If we are, if you're not able to necessarily deal with these gaps, we may not necessarily be able to fund the project, right? So this is where it, it gets where there is a way of using economic development to address uh some of the uh in, in, inequalities that exist in countries that are being done. And just to add, this is where developing countries almost for, on every occasion when a new treaty or instrument has been negotiated. We, we use the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And the question of capacity building, you know, you could have the best law, if you, do not have, if you do not have capacity building or transfer of technology in some cases to assist with treaty implementation, developing countries will breach because of the lack of the capacity to implement. So this is where um, we might adjust in question, what other things could be done? Capacity building measures, Let's see what happens next month um, in the Conference of Parties, a, a meeting, I believe, in the Middle East on climate change, whether more financing will be provided for loss and damage, or whether the Green, the green Climate Fund will be given the pledges that the major polluters under, under the polluter pays principle, whether they will pay to ensure that we are able to become part of the green transition 
especially as far as climate justice is concerned. That's a very good note to end on. Thank you for that, Eden. So we have to look out for COP next month to see what's actually happening. I mean, I think everybody here has felt the effects of climate change this year in particular. We've had extremely hot weather. Mm -hmm. I see some of my students here who have been suffering with me on Wednesdays when the AC just is not at its best. And we all suffer from climate change. So let's see what's happening next month. But thank you both for this very informative session. I think we've all learned a lot about the role of law and policy making, and we've seen it from different perspectives as well. I think we've also seen how, as Caribbean people, we can get involved and sent our careers around this type of thing. And it's very important that we have people from the region in these types of careers because we need to be represented on the world stage. We love to say, oh, we want our flag on the world stage. We need it on the world stage for this type of thing because it impacts our everyday lives. So thank you very much, both of you. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you. Have a good afternoon.